Uh, go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <laughs> I just got to say, you know, uh, volunteering to have this at our house was the, the biggest worry we had was we only have one bathroom. And so that's our concern. You know, uh, we all know what it's like to. Yeah, exactly. Boys around the garage is a perfect place. But, uh, you know, you always have that nerve that, uh, you know, when you got to go to the bathroom and somebody's in there. So that was our biggest concern. But uh, the elders assured us that ah, people can hold it. It'll be OK. And uh, uh, but I got to tell you, this was a, a miraculous thing to happen to our house here. This house has never been so clean inside. Let me tell you, we got to have stuff more often because I want my house to, to stay like this. But a big thank you to, to my wife, Kathy, and to Alona and to my own mother uh, who came and who uh, made it this all this happen. Uh, so we, we appreciate uh, your, your hard work in that. And uh, like I say, may, we'll have to continue maybe to do this every once in a while just to get us in gear here. Anyway, we opened up in 1 Corinthians last week, and uh, Dave did a good job of really just setting the tone for this epistle. It's Paul's longest epistle that he uh, wrote to any uh, church, and as he's uh, getting into this, he doesn't really attack any doctrinal problems as they have until chapter 15. And so we have to ask ourselves, if he doesn't correct any doctrinal problems till we get to chapter 15, what is 1 Corinthians really all about? We have a nice instance like to look into this personally that maybe other generations previously didn't have because of this COVID situation. Now, when COVID hit earlier in the year, uh, everyone went virtual. And thankfully we had the internet and that was all possible and feasible. Um, but I remember talking to some people that went to other churches and I asked them, you know, they were asking me what the process is like. And I said, well, actually this Zoom is right up our alley like this is it's almost like it was made for what we were doing uh every brother is able to share and and partake and uh it's a it's a unified effort and i said the only thing that's missing is we're not all taking of the the loaf and the cup together in the same space and he was like really and i was like yeah and i said so we really haven't missed a beat too much i think everybody just misses being together and he said you know it's funny when i get up in the morning on sunday I turn the TV on, we make a pot of coffee, we stay in our pajamas and we watch a 45 minute message and then we just go about our day. And I got to thinking, this is him talking, he says, I got to thinking, I don't know if this is all church is supposed to be. It doesn't seem like this is exactly what Jesus Christ had in mind when all this went down, that uh, we one day would just be sitting in our living room in our pajamas, listening to somebody teach us the Bible. And I said, well, it's interesting you think that because uh, you're, you're right. Uh, Christ did not have that in mind. I said, you know, when you think about what makes the church, the church is not a building. The church is not a place. The church is a gathering of people that gather together to the Lord Jesus Christ in a local location. So we have the universal church, which is every believer that's ever trusted Christ. We also have a local body. And what is the purpose of this local body? And we see in Acts 2.42 that it says it's supposed to meet for the apostles doctrine, for the breaking of bread, for fellowship and for prayer. These four aspects that are kind of an insight into what exactly is supposed to happen. Okay, so when we think of the apostles doctrine, I would say every church has done pretty well in the fact that they all get together for the teaching of the word. And that's what this gentleman was able to receive sitting in his living room in his pajamas. But when it came to the breaking of bread, many churches have gone away from a weekly breaking of bread. Uh, many churches have gone to a once a quarter or once a month. Uh, where they remember the Lord Jesus and the taking of the bread and the cup. When it comes to fellowship, people just kind of gloss over that completely. Uh, is that a meeting? Is that a special thing? Well, when we're all together, we have to remember that when we were saved, the Holy Spirit came in and dwelt us. And when that took place, when the Spirit came in and dwelt us, the Spirit gave us a gift. And that gift is not to be used for ourselves. That gift is to be used to encourage all the members of the body. So I have a gift that you need, like it or not. And you have a gift that I need, like it or not. This is how the spirit of God assembles these things. And so as a, as a brother or sister comes into the church, we look for the need that that person is supposed to fill because the spirit has brought that person there for a purpose. And that purpose in fellowship is to build each and every one up 
so that as a full body in Christ in the local area, we become a mature body in Christ. We're able to preach the gospel. We're able to see souls saved. We're able to see souls discipled. We're able to take care of people physically, practically, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, we are supposed to be a fully functioning picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth. When it talks about these ideas that prayer comes last, of all these things that we do for one another, one of the most important things we do for one another is we pray for one another. And so as we pray for one another, this is what creates this bond that brings us and keeps us all together. That when we all go through these hard times and we're all praying for one another, it's like we're living life together. We're in fellowship. One of the things that comes along with a local gathering, all those aspects, the other one is discipline. You're not a local body if discipline is impossible. Okay, we're a family because discipline can take place. I can discipline my children. Now, the world is getting to a certain place where they don't want me to discipline my kids. But that's my responsibility. It's the same responsibility in the church. And we're going to see Paul addresses each and every issue of what it is for the church to gather together in 1 Corinthians. All the problems that arise with all of these different people from different cultures and different backgrounds now all of a sudden are on one level playing field. And they're all supposed to encourage one another to live for Christ. And these are the problems that have arisen. And so Paul is writing to these people to solve those problems. Okay, and the reason why it's so uh, applicable to ourselves is because it's the same problems we all face. We all come to these problems. And the first and most important one, perhaps, that Paul is going to address is right here in chapter one. And he, in fact, takes about four chapters to get to this final point that he's making. And the most important thing he wants is no division. There is to be no division in a unified body because Christ is one and we are to be one. No divisions. So let's go ahead and break in. I'm going to break in in verse four. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him and all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short and no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame, to, to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things which of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 
that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, this is a, a great passage. Uh, the Apostle Paul pulls from Isaiah the prophet. He pulls from Jeremiah the prophet. And he's trying to bring everybody down to the same level. Nobody is above anybody else. Nobody is better than anybody else. And he's trying to get this point across to them that Christ died for you the same way he died for me. That I needed him as much as you needed him. That we are no better than one another. That we are all the same level and Christ is the head. So as Paul's getting into this and as he begins, he, he begins with thanksgiving. We know the background of Corinth. We know what, what, that it was a metropolis. We know that there was a lot of different culture in and out of the place. Um, we know kind of the Jewish mindset from the Gospels of what the Jews were looking for. And the fact that a crucified Messiah was anathema. They, they had no idea how to respond to a crucified Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to come and to rule and reign. Uh, they didn't know anything about one that would come and be crucified. The Greeks valued thought, philosophy, uh, intelligence. And so they liked Apollos. They liked these guys that could speak well and could entertain them. And so Paul is going to address each and every group and bring them back to the same level. And this is, this is how he's attacking this. So in verses uh, four through nine, this is uh, the, the, the idea that Paul is saying, these people have come behind in no gift. It's not that they're lacking anything gift wise or they need something gift wise. In verse 7, it says, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the faithfulness of the promise that we have. This is what God is going to do. This is what Jesus is going to do for us. In verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we were called into this fellowship with the son, we're also called into this fellowship with one another. And this is what Paul's addressing, this one another fellowship. So verse 10, this is beginning his argument. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. There be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I highly doubt, it may be possible, but I highly doubt it, that there is one person here, in person or or Via, via zoom that agrees with everything that i think about the bible my own wife doesn't agree with me about everything that i think about the bible my own wife doesn't agree with me with it just first corinthians about what's in first corinthians so i highly doubt that there's anybody here that would agree with me on everything in this bible so what's paul saying if we're all supposed to speak the same thing is it just repetition is it just we developed a set of doctrine and then we just adhere to that doctrine and everyone's got to be the same does anybody really think that like we're just supposed to be robots that way no that's not so that's not what he's saying so he's getting into this he, he's pleading with them that you all speak the same thing there be no divisions and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment if we all have a humble attitude if we all approach one another in humility, these problems don't arise. Now, we approach one another in, I know what's best, and I know better than you, so I need to be the one to tell you what to do. Or he thinks he's better than me, so he's going to tell me the way it really is. And if you don't see it my way, then that's it. Then there's no nothing. We can't, we can't be together. That is not what the Lord Jesus Christ intended in his local body, because it's the wrong attitude. Okay, we're going to have disagreements. We're going to have issues that we work out together. But if we all approach it from this mindset of humility, this is how it's going to be accomplished. So in order for us to be perfectly joined together, we have to understand that we're family. We're going to be together forever, like it or not. We're going to be together forever. And so we need to figure it out here and now. Because what's waiting for us here and now is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. When the Lord Jesus Christ is there uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying to his father and he's asking them, he's saying, Father, let them be one as we are one. Let, let, them, let them have the joy that only I can give them. Okay. 
only Christ could bring a group that we even have here together. We all would not have crossed paths had it not been for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit has brought this specific group of people together, and yes, you virtually too, to minister to one another that we would all be one in Christ. And so what Paul is pleading with these people is don't let arrogance overtake you to where you create divisions in the body. Don't let that arrogance come in the way. Because he's not addressing doctrine here. So it's not, we're not talking doctrinal issues. When we're, when we're talking doctrinal issues, we're, we're really arguing with the scripture. We're not arguing with one another. And so we try to have this in our own Bible study. And we meet with Steve Price, and believe me, we hash it out. And, and sometimes our voices are a little louder than they should be when we're talking about these things. But as we're going through, it's not my view and your view. It's how can we get to God's view? How can we get to what's God's mind in this? And sometimes we just have to say, you know what? I don't think we've come to agreement on these things. So we're just going to kind of, we're going to continue to study and work it out, but we're still going to minister to one another. You can have, like I say, me and my wife have disagreements in the scripture. It, we're still great. We still get along. There are times when my voice gets a little louder than it should too. Um, but in the end, we have this agreement that we're, we're, we're in it together. There's no leaving. There's no getting away from it. And we have to have that same mindset here as a body too. Um, you know, you, this is not a place where, you know, you get your feelings hurt and you leave and never come back. Um, that's not what family does. And so this is what Paul is addressing. He doesn't want anybody to leave. He wants everybody to come together. Perfectly joined. That's amazing. Perfectly joined, like the sinews of the body. Perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. When we all come to make a judgment, it should be a unified judgment. And if somebody is still in disagreement, they need to say, this is where humility comes in and says, I see that I'm on the, the other side. And so I'm going to humbly submit to everybody else so that this peace can still be enjoyed. Um, this is what takes place. It says, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household. Poor Chloe. She goes down as the biggest snitch in the New Testament. I mean, she just ratted all these people in Corinth out. But what, what you notice is that her name is here. There is nothing, and Kathy can attest to this, there is nothing that gets under skin my skin more than when somebody tells me, well, some people say that so-and-so has a problem. Who's some people? Who are they? What? Because at work, when somebody comes to me with a problem and says, I have a problem with so-and-so, Leroy has a problem with Elroy. And you say, okay, Leroy, have you talked to Elroy? He says, no, I didn't talk to Elroy. And I tell him, it sounds like you don't have a problem then. Because Elroy don't know. You haven't told him. He doesn't, he doesn't understand. And so I think what's important is if we're going to make accusations or we're going to bring things up for discussion, if you're not willing to put your name to it, you need to take it to the Lord and just keep it to yourself because this was something that Chloe was willing to say. You could tell him I said it. You could tell him I told you. And I think this is important because what happens if we don't know who this, if it was, uh, I hear from some people that this is what's going on. Everyone's going to say, I think it's so-and-so. I think it's that person over there. And it, that creates division. I have a problem with what Chloe said. Well, you can go talk to Chloe now because you know it's her. So if we're willing to put forward a complaint or a problem or an issue, we need to be willing to sign our name to that. That's my two cents. And it really just gets under my skin when that happens. And so she's the one that tells them there are contentions among you. <clears throat> now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas or I am of Christ. So uh, much has been made on the statements that Paul makes here, uh, different people. Uh, in chapter four, we find out that Paul doesn't actually tell it. Like these aren't really the divisions in the church in Corinth. Paul says that there are those that are there, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. I'm using these men as an example of what people are saying. Um, so he didn't want to call out those people per se in this statement. He just wants them to know this is what's going on. And in chapter four, as he gets to the end of this whole section that he's dealing with the Corinthians on, that's when he addresses this idea. 
much has been made of the types of people he mentions you know apollos being this eloquent preacher and this 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 guy that could really just uh, um, make you want to sit and listen uh paul this one that's been given all this revelation or peter the one that was fellowshipping with the lord and the close relationship and these eye of christ i'm not willing to take sides i just want to we don't know why there were divisions because it, it doesn't really go into it too much but we know that he's dealing with some issues and those issues are some people think they're wiser than others some people think their gifts are better than others their sign gifts that they have and so these are the things that perhaps are causing the division um, there are those that maybe be wealthy in this assembly and they're saying i'm of this wealthy person and he baptized me so these are the divisions that are coming up we can have divisions we can have divisions in our own assembly one of the one of the things we have uh with the ministries we have is that it can kind of create clicks snow awana brigade tnt we minister together we help out together this is kind of our ministry that the lord has given us and you get close to those people why because you see them all the time so the real work is to say how can we keep what we have and include more and make it bigger and make this fellowship and ministry bigger how, how can we bring more people in to help out because that is really what's missing so that these cliques and divisions don't form you know oftentimes you hear of church splits and often it rises out of like a high school uh, youth group and a high school youth group leader will get them all going and these are the people that are coming out and helping and all of a sudden this division takes place and nobody talks to nobody and years go by and you find that there's this big rift that's taking place we don't want that to happen and that's why the need for fellowship and prayer and all the things that the lord intended for us to be together the lord did not intend for us to be you know sitting alone listening and not talking to anybody um ministry is supposed to take place so as he's going this way he says uh is christ divided was paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of paul these are all obviously rhetorical questions is christ divided no was paul crucified for you no or were you baptized in the name of paul no <laughs> so he, he's bringing this about as why would you make a division if christ is one if we were all saved by the same person in the same way how can there be a division only if we think there is one and we make it christ had no intention of there being any divisions among us so paul is trying to bring them back to this base principle and in verse 14 he says i thank god that i baptized none of you except crispus and gaius lest anyone should say that i had baptized in my own name and he doesn't even remember all the people he baptized because he's probably dictating this letter to somebody that's writing it and then he probably remembers uh Oh, yeah, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. So Paul is thankful because they couldn't say, I was baptized by Paul, so I'm better than you. You were just baptized by a local guy here. You know, you weren't as important as I was because Paul was, I was one of the first converts here in Corinth. So we know that these were some of the issues. The key attitude of all of these issues is pride it's arrogance it's thinking that somehow something makes you better than somebody else in the local fellowship so in verse 17 for christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of christ should be made of no effect this is a huge verse um it really puts an, uh, a nail in the coffin of this idea that you have to be baptized uh to be saved um, Paul is, is making this distinction. If the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and the gospel is this message whereby which faith in that message has you born again, he separates it from baptism in this verse. Because he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. As if those are two totally different things. So, I don't think we have that kind of issue here, but if you ever talk to somebody, this is a big issue uh, out there. And this is the verse uh, to go to. It, 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 
should put to rest any, any kind of argument that they have. It says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. He didn't preach it with the wisdom of words. <clears throat> he's going to get into this, so I'm not going to address that portion right now. Uh, he's going to address it here in this next section. So beginning in verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. <laughs> there was a guy in, uh, I, I guess that would be like the second century. Uh, he was uh, the first real like critic. His name was Celsus. He was like the first critic of Christianity. And he wrote a criticism of the religion. And in, in kind of addressing this point that Paul is making, uh, he mocks Christianity and he says, you know, if you're a wise person or you're of some intelligence, we don't want you here. Uh, we only want the silly, the stupid, the slave, the woman or the child, because those are the only people that would believe uh, in, in the message that is being preached. <laughs> and in a way, he's right. So we take this, these, this passage and we say, all these people that think they're so smart out there and yet they can't trust in the plain teaching of God's word, how dumb they really are. And that's not the point of what we're supposed to do. Um, we're, we're all supposed to be equal in this way. He's just addressing something that would give somebody arrogance to, to, to bring them back down. So we're not to look negatively on anybody. Um, we're not to treat those that are intelligent, that, that, that scorn the name of Christ. We're not to treat them in a negative way. We're still to lovingly go and preach the gospel and, and minister to them that they would repent and trust in Christ. So we don't want to take this verse too far in a sense that now we think negatively of somebody else because then we'd just be, you know, crossing swords at that point. So he makes a statement. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, I, I can attest um, mm. that this is true for myself. When Kathy and I were first dating and I was not a believer, she would tell me the gospel and I would respond by saying that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. To think that you just believe and you're, you don't have to do anything else. That God requires nothing of you. That you don't have to live a good life. That you don't have to this. You don't have to try to obey. You don't have to work hard. That you just believe and you're, you're, you're good to go. And she's like, that's what the Bible says. And I'm like, that's dumb. That's dumb. That's what I thought. Because I thought I was better than these people. That's the attitude that Paul is trying to attack. That's the attitude that Paul is trying to break down. And what happens is as you continue to read the scripture and you see the wisdom behind it all, that God made it this way so that every person could trust Christ. Every person could receive the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it wasn't set aside only for these wise people. And so it says in verse uh, 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. This is from Isaiah 29. Uh, in Isaiah 29, he's, he's pronouncing all these woes. If you were back with us on a Wednesday night during our, I don't know, three years in Isaiah, uh, we went through a portion 20, 23 to 30 where it's just all these woes pronounced on all these different nations. And you could kind of imagine the children of Israel saying, yeah, down with those people and down with them too, and down with Egypt and woe unto them and being happy about it. But it gets finally to Israel and a woe is pronounced on Israel. And it's like, Hey, Hey, wait a minute. You know, what are we talking about here, Isaiah? And that's when, you know, they didn't like Isaiah too much at that point, but as it was going into that portion they were being attacked by Sennacherib up in Assyria. And the wise people of the area were saying, we can't just trust God. We got to go and get help from Egypt because Egypt has a grand army. We need to go down there and we need to get the Egyptians involved. We need to bring the Egyptians up here and then they can protect us. And God is saying, because of that attitude, I'm going to destroy those things. And so we see the Northern kingdom taken captive. Uh, Assyria comes down and destroys northern Israel and takes all those people captive and takes them away into captivity before uh, the nation of, of Judah. And so what's interesting in that portion is that 
all of the things that you would go to are wisdom of the world, not understanding the character and mind of God. And so in the same way, Paul is associating it to these people here in Corinth that you think you're better than somebody because of the wisdom in the world, because the wisdom of the world thinks that the smart, the wealthy, the noble birth are the ones that are important. And what God is showing us is that God values the poor, the blind, the dumb, all, all of these people, the slaves. God wants to save those people too, just as much as he wants to save those of noble birth. And so in verse 20, he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So this is, it's kind of, I mean, Paul's hard to follow sometimes, but this actually makes a lot of sense when you, when you break it out and think about it. So what Paul is saying is that this wisdom that the world created, that it's only for the strong, it's only for the intelligent, it's only for the noble. You have this message of a, a babe born in a manger who is the, the son of a carpenter, who is basically a homeless person that lived and ministered to the children of Israel and was a king, was given up by his own people, was taken to a cross, crucified, and then buried. And on the third day, he rose again. That is not the story that the world would tell of a great victor. That is not the story that we would think of as somebody that won the battle or won the day. But this is the message that God has given. And it's not through wisdom. We don't come to this understanding or uh, this knowledge of God through our own wisdom. We come because we hear the word being preached and we choose to believe. So God has made this plan where it's not about how smart you are. It's not about how rich you are. It's, it's not about uh, your nobility or anything like that or where you are. It's simply the message goes out and the message is received. When a person is there, and I can re attest to this because it wasn't that long ago, I thought the, that this gospel was dumb. And I can remember sitting in the meeting listening to this message and the message strangely enough from proverbs was if anyone seeks wisdom it's like why well, I, I seek wisdom I, I want wisdom i want to be intelligent i want to be all these things and it, he goes to this point where he says eventually they'll it'll be too late you'll cry and i won't hear you'll call out and i'll ignore and, and i won't answer and this sudden fear came over me what is he talking about too late um, what do I need to do? You know, how, how do I need to act or, you know, what do I need to commit to? And I can remember being shown the scripture. And the problem was with me. <laughs> the problem is not with what I didn't know. The problem was my attitude, my pride. I didn't want to admit that I was a person worthy of hell. I didn't want to admit that I was a person that couldn't achieve it on my own. If, 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 to, to put it nicely, if you all could get to heaven, certainly I could get to heaven. Okay. That was my attitude, right? If you all would be let in, well, God's not going to pass me up to let you guys in. That's how I felt. Okay. So this is, this is this attitude of arrogance. And this is the thing that prevented me from a relationship with Jesus Christ. The minute I repented and I said, you know what, Lord? I am this sinner that Christ died for. And to think that God would send his son, that God would take my sin and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ would willingly go to that cross, be nailed to it and shed his blood to pay for my sin. And God, the father would look at me, see that message given to me and see my reaction that I thought it was dumb. How angry would that make God the Father? To think that his greatest gift in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and died so that my sins could be paid for, would then see my reaction to it with pride and arrogance. We're going to come to find that in this portion, God has nothing to do with pride and arrogance. 
God has nothing to do with boasting. The moment I repented and I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I was saved. And I knew it. The burden rolled away. And all of a sudden, the scriptures made sense. And all of a sudden, it was like, God is a genius for coming up with this. But at the time, I thought, this is, this is foolish. As he's getting into this, this is the attitude he's trying to bring down. The minute I got saved, I realized I was, I was the lowest of the low. I was a just born Christian. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about what I needed to be doing. And so I take, I took this humble attitude and I just, I wanted to be, show me, teach me, tell me what, what, what is this Bible? Can you tell me how to find a verse in the Bible? Like I didn't know how to look at my Bible and all the attitudes of everybody coming together to, to, to help me in my Christian walk in ministry and in growth that I could be one day be a mature believer. And we're all working towards that together. That's, that's the attitude that, that God is really looking for, that we're all working together in this. The attitude that works against it is this attitude of pride and arrogance that creeps in. So again, verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. They didn't achieve it because they were smart. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. And this idea of the message preached, this word Caruso, is a herald, a proclamation. It's a guy that comes through. This guy did not come up with this message on his own, this herald, this, this guy that's going out and preaching. This guy is simply received the message and told to go out and preach the message. That's what Paul sees himself as. Paul did not, through his own mind and intellect on the road to Damascus, come up with all of this stuff. He was met by the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ told him what to do. And Paul went and obeyed. So this is the attitude he's saying, that it's not the wisdom of God. You don't, you're not going to sit there and think it through and, and come up with all this stuff yourself. It's through the message being preached in a herald-like herald way. And it says in verse 20, it says, Foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. So these are the two camps. Jews requested a sign. We saw that all throughout the gospel. They would constantly be trying to get the Lord Jesus do something to prove yourself to me. Uh, the Greeks at this point are saying, no, this doesn't sound very wise. And this is what that Celsus was saying. This is only for the dumb and the slaves and the women and children. He wasn't a feminist back then. You know, he didn't think very highly of that at the time. But one of the things that comes up in, in this portion is this attitude that, that when you talk to people, these are the types of people you run into. If God really wanted me to believe he would come, you know, Lord Jesus would appear and tell me. Or if God really, he really wanted me to believe, it would be like this amazing, miraculous revelation of wisdom that I would just come to understand through, you know, continuing to work at it or philosophy. And Paul is saying, that's not what God intended. That's not God's plan. It says, we preach Christ crucified. God sought to save people through the message of a crucified Messiah. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. To the Jews who wanted a sign, there was no worse sign than that of Deuteronomy, the man who hangs on a tree is cursed. That, that man that you say is the Messiah was a curse by God. He was cursed by God for us. He became a curse so that we could go free. When he talks about this idea of the, the Greeks look at it not as a stumbling block, but as foolishness, I can attest to that. You look at it and you say that just, it doesn't add up that God would just say, just by believing, just by faith in this message preached in the person of Jesus Christ, you can have everlasting life. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Uh, what's amazing in this portion is that for those of us that are here that have been born again, there is nothing that makes more sense than the gospel. <laughs> Before, it was so hard to understand. You, you didn't quite know. And once you're on the other side, it's like, it's, a, it's the simplest thing. He was my substitute. I had a debt I couldn't pay. He paid my debt. 
I only had sin. He only had righteousness. He suffered so that I could have his righteousness while he took my sin. It's the simplest thing that has ever been created, this wisdom of God. In verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Uh, it's funny, there's a famous lady um, who was a, a help to mission work, uh, like with the Wesley brothers and things like that. And she was a, a well-to-do lady, uh, very uh, Selena, I think her name was. Um, very well-to-do, very wealthy, but she always gave and ministered to these that were going and preaching the message. And she would say, I'm thankful for the M in this verse, that it doesn't say not any wise according to the flesh, not any mighty, not any noble, because she was noble. <laughs> so she said, I'm thankful for that M, that you know, I still have a chance here to, to be included in this message. What's interesting is that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. One of the things that comes up and it comes up in conversation. And I would say this is the insight into Kathy a little bit. I didn't tell you I was going to say this, but there's no time like the present. <laughs> One of the things that really gets under Kathy's skin is when she's working with somebody and they don't think she's intelligent and she run into this problem because she's always been so young you know here she is with with a master's and you know eight nine years of experience and three children and a major company and now with a major university and somebody's like well you, i don't think you know what you're doing and she's like let me send you the policy let me send you the response from the attorney let me let me give you everything i need and then if you don't obey what i'm telling you to do we're probably going to terminate you <laughs> you know so you have and so this is a it's just oh you know when somebody thinks you're dumb it's just like i'm gonna stick it to this person you know we none of us like feeling foolish none of us like feeling like we're weak or we we can't attain and so what happens is this arrogance rises up and we want to put other people down and as we put other people down we think that makes us better but what we find is that's what's causing these divisions here in corinth is that there's some people that are rising up that think they're better than everyone else. And Paul is saying, you want to be like the world? I thought you were a believer. I thought the Lord Jesus Christ saved you. I thought you understood the message of the gospel. That God did all of these things so that these rich, noble, all, none of that means anything in the economy of God. Because God cares about the soul of the person. And every soul is equal. And this is what God is after, souls. Not money, not birthright, not intelligence. He's after you as an individual. This should bring us great joy because we all realize that none of us were worth it. So what does that mean? It means that's how much the Lord Jesus loves us, that he would be willing to die and save us. So these are the things that God has chosen in order to put to shame all the other things. The world values the mighty, the world values the intelligent. The, the world values the rich. Uh, God doesn't value those things. Praise God. So he says, uh, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. This is the crux of Paul's point. Why does God not like any of these things? God despises boasting. <laughs> he hates it. He hates a, a prideful boast. And so he gets into this thing. No flesh should glory in his presence. But of, of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Once we come to this realization that for us, for me, for you, for all those that, that have been saved, there's nothing that we did that made us worth it. There's nothing that we did to make us deserve it. This is something that we've all received the same thing, the person of Jesus Christ. And what is Jesus Christ to us? The wisdom of God has presented to us, and he says it here, righteousness, his death and sacrifice on the cross, the shedding of his blood for our sin, 
has allowed God to state that we are righteous. It's a declaration that has been made. Okay. Sanctification. This is the process whereby we are going to be made perfect. Okay. We begin with this righteous standing. We live this life sanctifying ourselves, but the ultimate sanctification will come when we meet the Lord and this redemption. We're going to get a new body. He's going to take us out of this world and our body is going to be changed and we're going to get a new body that we can live forever apart from sin. This redemption is going to be taking place, full redemption. So he is what has taken place in the past, what is taking place present and what will take place ultimately in the future. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, again, this is a portion from the Old Testament, uh, Jeremiah nine and as as he's getting into this portion the whole mindset behind it is the only thing that is praiseworthy about us is the person of jesus christ so there should be nothing in any one of us that allows us to take this position of arrogance where a division would take place because we are all the same in christ jesus and so as paul is getting into this this is only the beginning of his instruction on this topic. It goes on for another three chapters and he deals with the message of a crucified Christ. Uh, the, this idea of wisdom continues to be brought up, the, the how gifts work and how we're not to exalt certain gifts over other gifts. Um, he gets into the practicalities and addresses the people directly. And once he gets through this portion, then he's gonna answer the questions that came in uh, one by one. And then ultimately, he's going to, to give his, uh, his own account of uh, spiritual gifts. So as we begin this portion, I think it's just a good reminder to us to remember uh, that Christ's death and, and sacrifice for us has made us one in Christ. Let there be no divisions uh, among us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we are thankful. Uh, thankful for the, the nice weather that you have provided. Thankful for all the help. Uh, and getting things set up and brought over here uh, for the ladies that uh, help prepare uh, dishes for the, the time for uh, the Sunday school teachers that were in there uh, ministering to the kids. Um, Father, for the opportunity we had just to, to share together, uh, we continue to pray for uh, our brother Sean, just in, in this case here, as we lift up the burdens of one another. Um, Father, we just ask that you would uh, protect him and, and heal him from this um, we do continue to pray just for the, the ministries that are taking place, that we would all be of one mind, uh, that we would all speak the same thing, that we would all come to the same judgment. And Father, that this would be a body that grows together uh, to a mature body in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are thankful for our head, for the one that has sacrificed himself in our place, for the one that has given us everlasting life, and Father, for the one that we owe everything to. Uh, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>